All right, let's see if I got everything ready. Let's see everybody here. We're going to go ahead and get started with the prayer. Let's begin. Father in heaven, you are God. We are so thankful, Father, that you are awesome, that you are almighty, that you are everlasting to everlasting. You created all things in the beginning by speaking everything into existence. And we're so thankful, Father, that we can come before your throne. We know, Father, that your will be done in heaven and on earth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us as we study this morning, that you'll help us to continue to bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that you'll help us, God, as we go through the study today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to lay aside the cares of the world, to cast all of our cares to you because you care for us, and as we come together uh, collectively to worship you, that we will do so in spirit and truth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us to examine our hearts Help us, Father, not to resist the Holy Spirit or to grieve the Spirit, um, but to be pleasing in everything that we do as we strive to walk in love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're making our way through uh, the Holy Spirit material. Thank you all for being here. We may have some who are uh, listening as well. I began last week in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 42, and I want to just keep uh, encouraging all of us to consider this passage here in Galatians 5 and verse 22 where Paul is talking about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. He said, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control. Uh, against such things, there is no law. Uh, it's a good reminder as we go through this study of the Holy Spirit of what we should be producing. If we are going to be uh, led by the Holy Spirit, uh, walking according to the words of the spirit, then we should be producing this kind of fruit. And so I want to just continue to encourage all of us as we go through this class and as we answer different questions regarding uh, the Holy Spirit, that you just keep that in mind. Uh, this past week, what kind of fruit did we bear? And what kind of fruit are we going to bear today and this week? Um, if we are listening to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, as does the Father, as does the Son. Therefore, this should be evident in our lives. Um, I don't have any additional workbooks. Uh, Lord willing, we can get some made for, for next week. Um, but I think we should all be able to um, follow along. Uh, we have a couple of uh, things that we need to do to make sure that we stay on pace here. And some of you were not here last week. And so if you have your workbook, what we did, we started looking at the Holy Spirit in the four Gospels. And so um, we started on page number four and got over to, um, actually, we actually didn't finish page number four. And I wanted to just kind of review. And there are a couple of passages I want to make sure that we touch on here. Uh, the first section here, as you think about studying the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, we've already covered the Spirit in the Old Testament, which becomes really important for us to understand the language in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also give us uh, insight with respect to Jesus, number one, the apostles, number two, and the Holy Spirit, which is going to help us as we get into the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, look over in Matthew chapter 10. We'll spend maybe uh, about 10, 15 minutes on this, and then I want to continue to move on. Unless there are questions, if there are questions along the way, please let me know. So in Matthew chapter 10, verses one through five, we find Jesus here. In verse number one, he summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So we know that Jesus appointed the 12. And verse number five, it says, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans. Now, this section here in Matthew chapter 10 gives us insight about this uh, limited commission, if you want to describe it like this, and also what they would also experience as they would go out into all the world, beginning in Acts chapter 2. This is going to be important because it gives us uh, uh, information concerning inspiration. That's a question that people often have. Uh, these men were inspired by God, what they said, and also what they wrote. All right, and if you look at verse number 16, notice what Jesus is saying to the 12. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake 
as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So think about the Apostle Paul, while he's not in this immediate context, uh, that certainly is going to happen for Paul. Think about Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, and other situations as well. So watch what Jesus says here. They're going to hand you over in verse 19. Don't worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father. The spirit of your father is referring to the Holy Spirit who speaks in you. That's the same language that we saw with King David, like in 2 Samuel chapter 23. So the Holy Spirit was going to give the apostles the very words to say. Therefore, they had nothing to worry about. So that's a great text when you think about inspiration. This is what inspiration is all about, right? The spirit speaking through the apostles. All right. Yeah. It's verbal inspiration. It's not idea. It's that's exactly right. Verbal inspiration. That's right. Where he's given them the very words. And I might add their verbal plenary inspiration where all of that, what we have is the very word of God. And so um, all the words that we find in every chapter uh, from verse 1 to the conclusion of a letter, those are all inspired words. And that becomes important, too, because if we have to guess which words are inspired and which are not, then we're in a lot of trouble. Because now we don't really know, well, what part is true and what part is just from, um, from man. So that's exactly right. Verbal inspiration, the very words uh, that they were going to speak. In the Gospel of Mark, we spent some time here as well. Look over in Mark chapter 16. We're picking up here at the end of the, of the, end of the book, actually. I'm just going to put all of that up here right now. In Mark chapter 16, after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, <clears throat> beginning in verse number, verse number 16, we, we know this text, or verse number 15, Jesus has appeared to the 11 in verse number uh, 14 as they were reclining at the table. He uh, reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. And so they needed some help as well with respect to believing that he had been risen from the dead because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. There were uh, women who had gone to the tomb who had seen Jesus alive. Look at verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. Um, you know, I associate this with the apostles. Now, certainly when you get in the book of Acts, were there other individuals who also were able to perform miracles? Who says yes? Yes, there were plenty of other people who were also able to perform miracles. That power that they had would be through the laying on of the apostles' hands. I want you guys to answer this out loud. Who's performing miracles in Acts chapter 2? <clears throat> Take a guess. Who is it? What group of people are performing miracles in Acts chapter 2? Apostles. The apostles. What about Acts chapter 3? Anyone? The apostles. In Acts chapter 4? The apostles. In Acts chapter 5? The apostles. You know who we finally start seeing performing miracles in Acts chapter 6? other men like Stephen and Philip. You know, when they start doing that, when the apostles laid their hands on them. So yes, there would be others who would perform miracles. It would be through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Does that make sense? This is important because as you think about this text here, um, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Not everyone is going to be able to perform miracles, even in the first century. Now, they're not taking place today, but just because we have believed and have obeyed the gospel does not mean that, okay, now I'm going to be able to perform these miracles as well. And so keeping it within that context. And so what we see in verse 17, what we see in verse 17, these signs will accompany those who have been, uh, who have believed in my name by the authority of Jesus. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Well, we, we've seen this in the book of Acts. Actually, turn over to Acts chapter 5 here real quickly. In Acts chapter 5, after 
Ananias and Sapphira, they had lied to the Holy Spirit. So here's another piece of information we're getting concerning the Spirit. He can be grieved. He can be resisted. He can be lied to. And we can obey him, right, if we're walking according to the Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit. How did Peter know their hearts? Because let's face it, we don't know what's in the heart of a man unless he tells us or it's revealed in some measure. Well, I believe through those miraculous gifts, he would be able to know through discernment that indeed that they had lied to the Holy Spirit. And so Sapphira, so, so she dies in verse 10. Look at verse 11. Great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. The church is not the building, right? It's not brick and mortar. It's flesh and blood. Fear came upon the whole church. At the hands of the apostles, verse 12, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. Notice the emphasis is the apostles, signs and wonders are, done, are being done by their hands, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. These were ambassadors of Christ or for Christ. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Look at verse 15. To such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow <laughs> might fall on any one of them. That is an extraordinary miracle. We talked about that last week. We had a lot of fun in class last week. A miracle is pretty amazing by itself. An extraordinary miracle? How do you get to that level? Well, that's what Peter had. Look over in Acts 19 real quickly here. Acts chapter 19, we saw this as well with the Apostle Paul. This is important for us because the words of Jesus, they came to pass. The apostles are performing these extraordinary miracles, not just miracles, but extraordinary miracles. And uh, again, this gives us insight as we get into the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 19, uh, verse number 11, Paul's in Ephesus. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left him and the evil spirits went out. Don't buy handkerchiefs on eBay or Facebook Marketplace or any other apostle website if you're looking to be healed, all right? Holy keep, water. Or holy water. Keep your money, all right? Keep it, okay? Save it. Invest it. Do something with it, all right? Give it away. But the apostles had this power, and it's because the Spirit was with them. Uh, they had received this power from on high uh, that Jesus had told them to wait for um, at the end of the Gospel of Luke. These miracles always served a purpose. They were to confirm the word, confirm the message, confirm the messenger, all right? Paul was an apostle. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Could he use his miraculous powers given to him by the Spirit to heal himself? The answer is no, all right? There is always a reason behind it to confirm the message and the messenger, and so that becomes important as we think about the Gospels. Now, multiple times for Peter for different stonings and floggings and so it wasn't that he wasn't allowed to be healed he was just not allowed to heal that specific thing because it probably was for a personal reason but when you've been stoned and the Lord still wants to send you to the next town yeah, yeah. you have purpose absolutely that's an excellent point that's exactly right and you think about courage courage is not when everything is exactly perfect that we say okay I'm going to rise up and be courageous you know, it would be courageous during the suffering. That's what he did. Can we go back to the place that stoned us like Paul did? That's courageous. And that's what Paul was able to do. That's what we're, that's the mindset that we should have, right? Let's be bold and courageous. Don't fear the one who can kill the body, but fear the one who can kill the body and the soul. Luke chapter 24, let's turn and look here real quickly. Uh, this is important as we get into the, the book of Acts as well. Uh, in Luke chapter 24, this is after the resurrection. Jesus is speaking to his apostles. Again, in verse number 44, he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's how the Old Testament would be divided up. According to Jews, there would be 24 books in the Old Testament. We have 39. They're all the same books. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, 
and that repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. This is what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, of where the gospel is going to be preached. Jesus is telling them this is where it's going to begin. This is going to parallel Acts chapter 1, uh, really verses 1 through 8. Notice he says, you are witnesses of these things. They witness Jesus not only die, but also alive after his death. They witness Jesus resurrected from the grave. Verse 49, behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you. That's for talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to see that with even greater clarity in John chapter 16. The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit that Jesus was going to send uh, upon the apostles. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Acts chapter 2 is ushered in in those first four verses with what? Power. Tongues. They're speaking in tongues. Tongues were always uh, a language, uh, a language that could be understood. And so that's what they do. They, they, they wait in Jerusalem. Uh, they wait for this power from on high. But this, this is very specific. This was told to people who are witnesses mm -hmm. of the things that happened that day, that they had to stay in Jerusalem mm -hmm. until they got that power. That's exactly so right. those are very time and position and time and history specific. That's exactly right. That we don't have access to. Amen. That's exactly right. It's a great point to put out to, to make the people as well. Uh, this power was for a particular group of people in a particular place and, you know, at a particular moment. That's exactly right. So people say, well, God has given me this power from the spirit. Uh, you know, when did you receive it? You know, it's, it's not going to work with the arguments that people make. Uh, excellent point with that uh, um, as well. Also remember that it's a promise from the father. So what did the apostles have to do to receive this? Well, that was a stipulation. Yeah. Comply, right? And and God is going to do the rest. We You just stay and listen to what I want you to do, and this is going to be given to you. That's exactly right. So let's look over in the Gospel of John right now. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, let me just pull all this up right now. So when you read John chapter 13 through 17, this is where context becomes really important. John chapter 13 through 17, I believe I've mentioned this before, um, is, a, is, a, is a block of scriptures together uh, with the Lord's Supper uh, in view right before Jesus is going to die. If you look at John chapter 13, turn over to 13, verse number one. I just want you to see this. If you do any Bible marking in your, in your Bible, this would be something good. I, I like to share this. And if I'm having a one-on-one -on -one with someone in a Bible study, look at verse two. Who do we have in verse two? Well, we have the name Judas Iscariot, right? The son of Simon. Look at verse number six. Who do we have there? Well, we have Simon Peter, all right? Now, Peter uh, is mentioned. Look at verse number 22. Verse number 22. The disciples began looking at one another. So the disciples here is referring to the apostles. Peter is mentioned throughout the rest of John chapter 13. Now look at John chapter 14, and this is the importance of context, because when people start talking about the Holy Spirit in 14, 15, and 16, they are not careful, can take it out of the context. Look at John 14 and verse 5. Who is mentioned there? We got Thomas, we got Judas, who's already left. We got Peter, we got the disciples, we got Thomas. Look at verse number 8. Who do we have next? We got Philip. Look at verse 22. Who do we have next? We got Judas, not Iscariot, right? So within the text, we see exactly who the audience is, all right? And here's why this is important. Look at John 14 and verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. The helper is the Spirit. That is, here it is, the Spirit of truth. So when you see this language, the helper, that's pointing back to the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you, all right? And so the Spirit is going to be with the apostles. Look at verse 26 of John chapter 14, John 14 and verse number 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. 
Stop right there. There you have a verse that shows the Godhead. The Bible teaches there is one God. There is one God. And there are three that, that make up this one God, or three distinct personalities in the Godhead. In the one verse here, you have Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit. So he's not talking about himself. And then he speaks about the Father who's going to send the Spirit in his name, or in my name, or by his authority. So we find evidence of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That becomes really important as we think about the Spirit. Let's be careful with how we talk about the Holy Spirit, and let's be careful with assuming certain things about him that we would not with the Father or with the Son. That's very important. So the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, who's he talking to? He will teach you. Who's the you? And the class said, oh, we're all tired this morning. <laughs> you, that's right, the apostles. He's going to teach you all things. So if you think the Holy Spirit's going to give you a ready remembrance of everything in your workbook or sermon before you get up or Bible class lesson, you're in a lot of trouble, all right? Put some prep time in, all right? <laughs> he will teach you all things. You see how that connects back to Matthew chapter 10, though? Don't worry about what you're going to say. Why, why worry? I would worry if I'm going to stand before kings and governors, wouldn't you? But he's saying, no, you don't have to worry because he's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That's a really big deal. That gives us confidence in the word of God. If the apostles didn't have a good memory about the ministry of Jesus, we're in a lot of trouble because we got two apostles who wrote the gospel, Matthew and John. Mark was a close associate with the apostle Peter. Now we're in even more trouble. And Luke is a Gentile who was investigating and interviewing these apostles. So if they're not remembering everything, then now we can't have great confidence in what we have. But that is not a problem. The Spirit was going to teach them all things to bring your, to your remembrance all that I said to you. All right, comments, questions? Yeah. So for there to be a Latter-day Revolution is an indictment against the Holy Spirit yes. that he did not provide them everything they needed in the first century. Amen. That's exactly right. A, a Latter-day Revelation. If you study with Mormons, uh, I know we st you studied, I mean, we had talked about that a couple of years ago, right? There's a additional revelation. Jude verse 3, contend for the faith that has once for all been delivered. God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We have that through the words of the apostles in, uh, what is that, Second Peter chapter 1. That's exactly right. People who make these arguments that there is additional revelation is actually fighting against the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Any other comments? Questions? Yeah, please. There were two situations where the Holy Spirit was directly involved in, in the miracle, creating the miracle. Okay. Two very specific and very uh, landmark cases. The first was the day of Pentecost mm. when he had the, the rushing of the wind and the placement of the fire, fire tongues. And they the apostles didn't decide to speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. It was the Holy Spirit doing that. Mm -hmm. And then in Acts 10, mm -hmm. with the confirmation of uh, Gentiles with Cornelius. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, those were two monumental moments. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm correct in my thinking, baptism, baptism of John was, but when Peter said in verse 38, repent and be baptized, mm -hmm. We don't see anything but the baptism, the, the baptism of John before that. Mm -hmm. So that new revelation was there. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Spirit's definitely there in, in a powerful way in chapter 2 and in, in Acts chapter 10. And that's why, you know, I've mentioned in this class, everything points back to Acts chapter 2. I have a workbook called, I know Acts 2.38, but I don't know Acts 2. Mm -hmm. Everything points back to Acts chapter 2. Where is Acts chapter 10 pointing back to? Acts chapter 2. These prophets are all pointing to what the Spirit's going to do in Acts chapter 2. That's exactly right. So it's a pivotal chapter for us where we see the Holy Spirit working. Absolutely. Excellent point. All right. John chapter 16. Let's keep moving here. So John chapter 16, it's the same context, same person speaking, same audience. G Jesus with the apostles. Uh, people want to know the work of the Holy Spirit or what, it, what, what might that look like. All right, look at verse number seven. Jesus said, but I tell you the truth, 
it is to your advantage to the apostles that I go away. So he's been talking about his ascension for quite some time. It's for our advantage as well, right? He's our great high priest in heaven. It means that the kingdom has now been established. It means that we have forgiveness of sins through his name. Uh, for if I do not go away, the helper, so he uses this language quite a bit in John, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he's going to be sent by the Father. Remember, or sent by Jesus. This is a promise that they were to tarry for. And he, notice the, the, the language, he, he's not just some kind of it. Uh, he, he possesses personality, qualities, a personhood. He, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You just brought up Acts chapter 2. What do we see in Acts chapter 2? Men and women are being convicted of what? Of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. The prophecy of Joel in Acts chapter 2, there's a lot of judgment language in Joel chapter 2. And that's what we see. How is the Spirit going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? It begins with the preaching of the gospel in Acts chapter 2. All right? That's part of his work. He continues to do that today. He continues. Have you ever been convicted of your sins? How, how does he continue to convict us of, of our sins? Through the teaching of the word of God, through the revelation. And I'm going to do a sermon called The Name and Mentality. Don't take for granted God's revealed word. A lot of people say, well, yeah, it's just the, the, the Bible. Or, I mean, it's just the word of God. Give me something more. Well, you have the very words of the Holy Spirit. And these words will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged, talking about the devil. So um, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the kingship of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, the defeat of Satan. Look at verse 12. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's a great example of like this idea of progressive revelation, right? The apostles struggled often in the ministry of Jesus, didn't they? Even after his death. Remember what they went back to doing? What did Peter go back to doing? Fishing. Yes, go back to work. <laughs> Let's go fishing. Well, wait a second. You had three years of hearing this sermon over and over again. And so he said, well, look, I, I, there's other things that you can't bear. Have you ever thought about, I want to hear from you guys real quick. This is just something off the cuff. You ever thought about what that might be? What is it that something that Jesus had not yet told them because they couldn't bear it? I got one idea, but you guys have any thoughts? What what might be something they couldn't bear? Chapter one, they said to him, Lord, now you're gonna become king. Like he thought they still were looking for a physical king, even in Acts chapter one. Well, I don't know if they're still looking for a physical king. Um, I've changed my view with that a little bit. They're asking about the timing of the kingdom. Will you now restore the kingdom at this time? And he says, Well. It's not for you to know. So on one hand, he had spoken to them about 40 days concerning the kingdom. And so that's, that's kind of been my understanding. But what was one other big, big issue for the first century church? Gentile, Gentile salvation. This kingdom was always Jewish in nature. Who's prophesying about the kingdom? The Jews. But this kingdom is not going to have any borders. All nations, Isaiah 2, are going to flow into it. So when I think about this idea of, I got a lot of things to tell you, you can't handle it right now. You can't bear it. Do you remember what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2, verse 21. He's quoting from Joel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Whosoever includes who? Gentiles. So did Peter remember that when he get to Acts 10? <laughs> you know what it took Peter to get to the house of Cornelius? The Holy Spirit. It took miracles to get him to break through that wall, that barrier, that division between Jew and Gentile. So maybe he's talking about that there. Uh, you can't bear them now, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. This is something I, I try to emphasize quite a bit. He's talking to the apostles. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what it is to come. And that's what we see. Beginning on Pentecost, the power from on high is received by the apostles. 
They speak in tongues. Tongues were always a language. They begin to open up the doors to the kingdom of God for Jew and eventually Gentiles as well. And they're going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Let me stop here for comments, questions. Please. There's something that's kind of interesting, I think, about these verses here in John. Uh, he uses that word that we translate to the helper here, right? It's sure. that Greek word, directly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It only shows up one other place outside of these chapters in John. It's in 1 John chapter 2, two verse 1. Yeah. But it's speaking in reference to Jesus, not to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But it kind of helps you understand the nature of the role of both of them as mm -hmm. the Godhead. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, the word helper is paraclete, and we also see it in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Jesus, our propitiation and our advocate, and what a blessing that is, right? We have the accuser, the devil, I believe in Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 1, who in that prophecy or in that book, you know, stood before God day and night uh, accusing his people. So excellent point, yeah. Uh, and what a blessing that you know, it goes back to this language that we've seen with what the Spirit is going to provide, right, with respect to blessings. Yeah. Just that, do you have to remember to put the Bible in in the place that it is supposed to be? So the Bible is an incredible literary work. It, yes. Both in its antiquity and its writing merit and the cohesion of the story, mm -hmm. the years and the amount of writers. But it's not a lyric, literary work. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people look to the Bible for philosophies and they find, oh, imagine that. They find great truths of philosophy in it. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. It's also not a book of magic or mis mysticism or spells. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to read through the Bible and, you know, enchant yourself into the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We have to use it in the way that it was intended to be used in that we read it and we let our heart be changed by the words so that we can then change our actions. Mm -hmm. But when we, in the same with the spirit, we have to put him in the proper place of where, of where he falls in his relationship with us. Mm -hmm. We can't uh, minus or add to that mm -hmm. in ways that the Bible does not describe. Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And when you think about the work of the Holy Spirit, don't, don't take it for granted. Uh, what you possess in your hand, uh, we have this revelation from the Spirit, from God. What an awesome thing to consider, that we can hear from the Spirit as often as we want, and we can hear from God as often as we desire. That's an awesome thing. Any other comments or questions? All right, let's keep on moving then. Let's turn over to page number five. Uh, Page number five is looking at here, uh, getting into the book of Acts. Um, so we've already laid the groundwork for the Old Testament. Uh, we've laid the groundwork for um, the Gospels. Uh, Luke, obviously, was written by uh, Luke and also Acts. And so Luke is a prequel to the book of Acts. So it's appropriate for us to, uh, to also look at um, Luke and the other Gospels as well. And so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus... Uh, uses this language here uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so the apostles are going to be witnesses for Jesus, witnesses of his resurrection. In fact, when you turn over to Acts chapter, let's just say in Acts chapter 1, verse number 1, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So Jesus had spent over a month after his resurrection uh, with the apostles. Um, it was very clear to them that indeed he had risen from the grave. If you turn over to Acts chapter 2, and I want you to see and notice the argument of Peter. In Acts chapter 2, he really dives into speaking about Jesus the Nazarene in verse number 22. He's going to quote from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, beginning in verse number 25. 
and he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 29, he says, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he, David, both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet, so David was a prophet, and he was a king, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead. That's what prophets often did, although they also prophesied about current events as well, and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. So he's quoting from Acts 2 again. I'm sorry, from Psalm 16 again. Look at what he says in verse 32. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we, the apostles, are all witnesses. And so that's what they were going to witness about. It is fascinating. One thing you can do in your workbook I have Bible verses of the chapters. Notice how often they talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Over and over and over again. That's because everything changed with the resurrection of Jesus. So keep that in mind as we go through the book of Acts. We know where they were to tarry. Joanna already mentioned that, right? They were to wait in Jerusalem. And this also is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy and also instruction from God. We also know that um, they're going to continue to to preach in Jerusalem, and the word uh, is eventually going to to spread out um, to other places. Uh, If you turn over to Acts chapter 8, the apostles are going to remain in Jerusalem. Now, they will, a few of them will travel to some other places here. In Acts chapter 8, Saul this is after the death of Stephen, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. So the apostles are going to remain in Jerusalem. Now, there is a case in Acts chapter 8 where Peter and John go somewhere. Who remembers where do they go and why? Anyone remember why? If not, we'll look at it together. All right. Philip, where had Philip, not the apostle, gone in Acts chapter 8? Samaria. That's exactly right. This Philip, this is not the Apostle Philip, but this was the one who had received power from the Apostles through the laying out of hands in Acts chapter 6. Look at what Philip did in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. This was Simon the sorcerer. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. This man, uh, Simon, he was a trickster. He was a liar. And he convinced people through tricks, talk, and testimony. Come look at this guy. This guy has some great power. And he deceived a lot of people. Look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So you help me out here. They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. What do you think that meant? Praying to receive the Spirit? Is that something we should be praying for today? Any thoughts? I I can't hear you guys. What? To be converted? Well, I would say no, because they were already converted. They were converted back in verse number 12 and 13. So this is something different than conversion. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is something that obviously they could physically see. Because in verse 18, Simon saw that after the laying on of the hand, something was happening. He witnessed that when the okay. apostles laid their hands on people, something was happening. Yes. They're speaking with their tongue, they're performing miracles. There and we go. That's what we talk about. All right. So what he is driving out here, Luke, when he says they had received the word who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, verse 16, 
for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Number one, when it says that they had simply been baptized, he's not downgrading their baptism. He's not downgrading obedience to the gospel. He's simply saying they, they obeyed the truth, and yet they did not have any miraculous gifts or power, which is actually a great argument to make, right? When you obey the gospel, it doesn't mean you're going to receive miraculous power. That's why Peter and John are actually going there, because they're going to impart this miraculous power from the Holy Spirit. See here in one second. Look at verse 17. Then they began laying their hands on them. Who's the they? Peter and John. Peter and John. And they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands. So that's where we get this Bible language, the laying on of the apostles' hands. We see it in Acts chapter 6. Now, laying on of hands could also be a way of sending someone off or sending someone away, endorsing someone. So context is going to determine what this laying on of hands. So in this context, it was the giving of the Spirit, which is referring to the giving of this miraculous power. Yeah. And that's how you know this is Philip the preacher, not Philip the apostle. Because Philip the apostle yes. had the power to yes. give gifts. Only apostles had the power to give the gifts. Excellent point. <laughs> that's exactly right. So there were occasions. Yeah, I think maybe the praying for them to receive the Spirit could possibly be that they were praying for wisdom and discernment mm -hmm. as to whom mm -hmm. they would lay their hands. That's a good point, too. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Any other comments with that? Please, Chet. I think some of that, I would say this the right way, but like the apostles, you know, back when we first started in the first class where the Millennium Commission, he told them specifically not to go to Samaria. Yeah. Not to go. Mm -hmm. So I think they could have, it could have simply been they were just double checking. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just the right time. You know, you know just, yeah. I, I just, I don't always, Are you I, sure? Yeah. yeah. Just go through the book and you can see that the Holy Spirit led them. Yeah. You know, what they, they didn't have just total knowledge. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, they, they wasn't, too, you know, they, they led them in all truth, but it didn't lead them to make every perfect decision. Sure. Yeah. You know, every, it didn't guide every, every book. Stepping to it, right? yeah. In other words, you know, they there are certain things they still didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. you know, absolutely, so, yeah, absolutely. No, he did, no, absolutely. And um, I think we're going to talk about that later on in the book. Just because a person was inspired did not mean that they could not sin. Which apostle who was inspired do we have recorded with respect to the sin? In here, Peter, he was condemned, he stood condemned. So, just because someone was inspired did not mean that now they had like this shield around them that they can never do any wrong. They still have free will and choice, all right? And so that's exactly right. Peter and John are going there to impart miraculous gifts. This is why the book of Acts is such a great study on the Holy Spirit, because it answers so many of these questions that we sometimes have and that other people have as well. And so they're going to be witnesses. The gospel is slowly and surely going to spread uh, if you turn over to Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 22, um, we see that the gospel is going to continue to spread. Uh, saints are preaching the gospel as well, as we saw back in Acts chapter 8, verse number 19 of Acts 11. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, I find that interesting. Isn't that interesting? Going This goes all the way back to Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, and can good things come out of persecution? Suffering doesn't make any of us unique. You know what it does? How we respond to it. That's exactly right. Evangelism, reaching lost souls, can still take place even in the most challenging moments. Uh, so in connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews own, alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So the gospel is going out to all nations. That's how the gospel is designed, the, the church or the kingdom. It is for all people, and this is what we see. We see the gospel spreading, 
Uh, little by little, maybe not little by little, but it's spreading rapidly. We'll go over in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, what we have in the gospel in the book of uh, Acts, we have the missionary journeys of Paul, and it's something really impressive for us to consider. Excuse me, where Paul is going to travel thousands of miles, guided by the Holy Spirit. There's a number of prophets and teachers. The church in Antioch, and at the beginning in Acts 13, would be a great personal study to investigate that church. There's just so many great things they did. They sent out men, uh, supported these men. These men would come back to that church to give reports. Look at verse 2, though. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, so before we dive into really any of the big chapters of Acts, we know the Spirit can be resisted, He can be grieved, He can convict, He can guide, He is described as a helper, and what do we see in here? He speaks, He speaks. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. So isn't that interesting? You have that same statement, laying out of hands. Well, in this context, it's not talking about spiritual gifts. I don't believe it. I think it's just talking about a, a, um, approval. And they sent them away. Look at verse four. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. Now, the Spirit can send them out. You guys know what else the Spirit was able to do during the ministry of Paul regarding certain places or locations where he went? He could also, what is it, Paul? Pop the brakes. Pop the brakes. That's exactly right. Look at Acts chapter 16. All of this is in, uh, this is uh, Paul's second missionary journey. And there's just a map there if you're interested in that. Um, in Acts chapter 16 and verse number six, they pass through the the Phaerician and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Not because the Holy Spirit didn't want certain people obviously saved or anything like that, but there is something here about, I think, protecting these men and the timing or providentially there's something going on. In verse 7, the Spirit did not permit them. How did that happen? I don't know exactly. It's not recorded exactly how that happened. I'm not for sure. Maybe it was just the, the Spirit telling them, no, you just need to remain here. What we do understand, though, is the Spirit is all in the book of Acts. The actions of the apostles, that's why I say we can call it the actions of the Holy Spirit, guiding them where to go, forbidding them in certain places, speaking to apostles like Paul and Barnabas. He was an apostle, but not in the sense of the twelve. Uh, but one who was also sent out. And so it's a fascinating study that we're going to see the spirit involved in the work of the apostles uh, all throughout the book of Acts. So there's a third uh, journey there. So we got a few more minutes here. Um, and I want to wrap up here and we can talk about any other questions that you may have. Um, the, when you think about the, the, the book of Acts, um, just some additional details for you. Uh, the kingdom of God is being ushered in with power. It's a great book to understand what discipleship is all about. Luke is speaking about disciples and becoming disciples of Jesus. Take up your cross and follow me. Acts is going to give us the details of how one becomes a disciple and how we continue to walk with God. And so as you think about the book of Acts, it's a fascinating study. Uh, I want to encourage you to... Um, Stay committed with the, with the workbook here. Uh, I know we have two minutes left uh, next week, Lord willing. Uh, Adam is going to lead us in our class. And um, on page number six, there is a text going all the way to page 6E, which is Acts chapters 1, 2, and 3. And Adam, Lord willing, will teach on lesson seven, um, the Godhead. This becomes really important. And um, we'll talk some more about this. Any final thoughts? Uh, what are you taking away from all of this as we wrap this up today? More than just details and facts. Um, any final thoughts? Active. The Holy Spirit is active. And the Holy Spirit, he has been active from the very beginning. He has been active from the very beginning with creation, with prophesying, inspiration, the work of the kingdom. Yeah, what else? 
Yeah, please, Adam. It's interesting. Jesus says the spirit can't come until I am gone. Mm -hmm. So you start thinking about the why. Yeah, uh, right. Of course. What happens if the Holy Spirit comes while Jesus is here? Mm -hmm. You think about the miracles Jesus did, the miracles the apostles did after Jesus is gone. They're mm -hmm. very similar. That's true, right? So. I think part of that is not to detract from Jesus mm -hmm. and who he was, mm -hmm. right? And then after, now they're able to do these miracles that all point back and talk about yeah. the guy that you just killed. Yeah. He's the one that you were looking for. Right? Excellent observation. Absolutely. Chuck? I was just going to say the, the strength that he gives the man uh, in, in the book of Acts. I think about Philip before we finish. Yeah. He saw Stephen killed, right? Yeah. And then he goes out. You know, out of his way out of his comfort zone, goes to Samaria and preaching. I just think the strength that he gave him, you know, you have that same, yeah, you that same strength. Yeah, amen. Yeah, please. Yeah. It's just purposeful, you know, because we always talk about like, um, you know, being the spirit does the different things, the spirit helps the apostle, like, do their job if they can able to do a job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's purpose behind the spirit. Um, there's not chaos when the spirit is on the scene. I think that's a great contrast to make. People today think the spirit just brings chaos and confusion. That's what's happening in religion. But the spirit in the book of Acts is bringing order and salvation. You have a comment, sister? I was going to say somewhere like how misinterpreted and abused the idea of the Holy Spirit yeah. by so many people. Yes. Yeah. And they think the are speaking gibberish. Like when it says, so clearly, like, yes. it's, if you can't understand it, then it's not, you know, it's yeah. not from God or things, or if it can't be interpreted, just be quiet. That's exactly right. Oh, and, yeah. you know, just so many things. Yes. How, like, you know, it actually, like, when I first became, well, when I first started going to church and when I was at the church and now, oh, the Holy Spirit, like, people touch people and they would fall. And I was, yeah. I was more scared. Like, that wasn't making me want to go to that church any longer. Yes. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, give me at me. Yeah. You know, so it's scary yeah. how people are using it. There's a lot of drive away from God. Yeah, it's driving people away from God. That's exactly right. So um, excellent thoughts. So the Godhead next Sunday and do some Bible marking in those chapters that I've given you in the workbook. I think it would be a great exercise. The Holy Spirit, the apostles. What do you see in Acts chapters one, two, and three? Thank you, guys. We'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 Y